it is now recording. So very good. All right, so this we're all good again. Um, so we go through a few, you know, two, three announcements first. Okay, so just to make sure that we are up to date, uh, there is a Uba Mesa event on tomorrow. Okay, so on Thursday tomorrow, um, which is the fifth at twelve noon time. Uh, the STEM home base, or you can do it virtually by you know clicking or you know scanning the QR code. Um, so this is a workshop, you know, that is focusing on you know how to launch your career as an engineer. And I think you know by means of engineer, it includes your know, software engineer. So it's not just your know, hardware or elect electrical engineer. Um, so that's one event. Um, if you want to attend this one, this one can be remote, which is nice. Um, another event, it's not an event, it's a college hour thing. So this one is about stress management and no doubt I helped to contribute to the stressful situation. <laughs> so this one is also tomorrow and almost exactly the same time. This one is at 12.15, starting at 12.15, ending at 1.15. So, you know, you probably have to choose one to attend and probably not be able to attend both. You can probably attend both, okay, by putting, you know, on ear, one earbud to zoom on one and then be physically present on the other one. But I'm not sure how much information you can get in by trying to attend your know, two workshops or meetings at the same time. All right, so there's that. It's okay, it's just me and Jared right now. I mean, I can deal with the stress myself. But what if the career gives you extra stress? <laughs> well, I guess I'm just out of luck. Yeah, no stress. You wouldn't have to stress out about a career. No, you're right. <laughs> there you go. I had one student, okay, you know, who has uh, you know transferred to Davis at this point. That particular student took CISP three ten from me, but not four forty. And uh, he, when he talked to me, he said, "I'm really stressed out." I go like, "Why are you stressed out?" You know, he said, "I, I took four forty." Go like, "Okay, it was an easy class. I got a really good grade. It was an easy A." I go like, "Yes." That's what's stressing me out because I know it's not supposed to. <laughs> of course, I'm not going to name the college that offered that class. <clears throat> All right, third announcement. This one really counts. This one is really important. You have two assignments you're being active at the same time. So one is the relation assignment that I was intending to assign on Monday, but I forgot. Some of you got started anyway, so I gave all of those people one extra attempt. So just kind of finish you know, whatever you are, whatever is ongoing, and then start a new one. But if you haven't started yet, you only have one single attempt until the due date, which is next Wednesday at 3 p.m. Okay, so that's one. And then we, I'm going to give you the CNF assignment also today, and you have one week to work on this one as well. So this one is about Boolean algebra. I reduced the complexity of the question compared to last year. So I think it is quite doable in a week. Um, it doesn't mean that you can, you know, it doesn't mean that I encourage people to start like, you know, a few hours you know, before 3 p.m. next Wednesday. That's not gonna work. But if you start today, okay, and actually spend some time with it, like on and off, I think, you know, it's not gonna be too much. The idea is you, know, you don't want to kind of keep on it all the time. You get started, okay? You get some of the, you know, idea, you know, into your answer. And then when you're stumped, you just kind of walk away a little bit and then come back later, okay? That's, you know, probably a better way to use your time on this particular homework assignment. All right. That's the CNS assignment that's also doing this as well. Yes. Mm -hmm. So you have two assignments. One is really simple, you know, I can even give you a quick <clears throat> rundown on the relation one. The relation one looks like this. So there are seven questions and, you know, they really kind of boil down to, do you understand you know, what is reflexive, what is transitive, what is anti-symmetric, and their relations, you know, um, among these ones too. So, you know, it really just kind of boils down to the understanding of, you know, what each one means. Uh, there are some obscure questions, you know, of, you know, okay, we have two relations defined over X, we know the intersection is reflexive, then what do we know for sure about R, okay, so, you know, so you have to 
do some reasoning you know, on these ones. You know, it's not just a definition kind of question. But it eventually boils down to definitions. So that's kind of what you need to you know, focus on, on the definitions. All right. So this one has seven actual just you know, distinct questions like that. And then the other one is a little bit more complex. So I'll explain that first. And then we'll go over the material that you need in order to get the assignment done. Okay, so we move on to the <coughs> CNF one. CNF, by the way, stands for conjunctive normal form. So it's down here. All right, so the CNF one is you know, giving you, I give you one uh, Boolean expression and you have to turn it into a CNF. That's it, okay? That is the assignment. So that means you have to do derivations you know, with a very definite objective you know, in the end. Is that okay? So we'll talk about what is a CNF today. That's kind of that's going to be today's topic, and I'll also give you an example of how to do this by hand today. Okay, but this one is all about Boolean algebra. I spell out all the Boolean algebra rules down here. I mean, it looks like there's a whole lot, but many of these you are familiar with already because they are exactly the same as in your typical usual um, algebra like commutative, okay? You guys know that already. So instead of saying A times B equals to B times A, you say A and B equals to B and A. Instead of saying A plus B equals to B plus A, you say A or B equals to B or A. Even the identity ones look, should look familiar, right? A times one, or A and one, A and true is A. A or false is also A, okay? So many of these are almost exactly the same, we, there are only a few that are like, oh, wait, this one doesn't make sense in algebra, doesn't make sense in normal algebra, but it's in Boolean algebra, like distributive. This one here, okay, the one that I'm highlighting right now, is true, this works in Boolean algebra, but it does not work in normal algebra. So this is one of the few um, that do not work, you know, in uh, normal algebra. Um, then you have something that's also very specific to Boolean algebra. You know, those are the complements. So A or the complement of A or A or not A is always true because one of them has to be true because they are, they are opposites of each other. So if one is true, the other one has to be false and vice versa. And then for the same reason, the conjunction between A and not A has to be false because one of them also has to be false. So when you have a conjunction, that means, you know, okay, the conjunction has to be false because at least one or exactly one of them has to be false. De Morgan's law is one of the trickier ones, okay, because you, know, it's, you can look at it as a distribution of negation. So when you have a negation on the outside of the or, you can, quote, unquote, distribute the negation to whatever you're oring, but then you have to end the two components. So the or becomes an end after you distribute the negation. I'll demonstrate all of these in class today. And then the opposite is also, is also true. The negation of A and B is not A or not B. So anytime you look at these your rules here and you go like, I'm not buying it, use a truth table to show yourselves that, oh, okay, I guess it does work. Is that okay? Because using a truth table really helps to illustrate you know, why these particular rules work. And then we have a bunch of simplifications the first two should not be too surprising. A and A is just A. B or A, A or A is also just A. Okay? Is that okay? All right. Now, these two, you know, would take a little bit of convincing because this one says, you know, A or uh, A and B is just A. In other words, you know, the A, B, the A and B term here is totally useless. Well, does it make sense to you? Because if A is true, then the whole thing has to be true. If A is false, then the whole thing also has to be false. Because if A is false, then A and B is going to be false, and A itself is also going to be false. You end up with false or false, which is false. Okay, so you, if you reason it out like that, it actually makes sense. But when you look at it the first time, it's like, oh, I'm not sure about that. The same For the same reason or similar reason, A and, and then A or B as a whole, it's just A too, because if A is true, then A or B is guaranteed to be true, then you have A and A, which is true or true, so the whole thing is true. What if A is false? Well, then I don't even care what B is, 
because A is one of the components of the conjunction. So when A is false, the whole thing also has to be false. So once again, if you're not convinced, you know, just by you know, listening, listening to me reasoning it out, you can use a truth table, then it will be pretty obvious why the equality holds. Uh, resolution, we just talked about this last time. It's not one of the ones that I really want you guys to use, but if you want to, if you see an application of that, you can go ahead and use it. Um, and then we have the usual associative law, which means you know you can you know, dissolve the parentheses when you have a bunch of ors. The ordering of you know, how you put the parentheses is not important, just like you know, when you have an addition or when you have a multiplication. So those are the rules, okay? You know, basically, most of those are the same ones that you are familiar with already, uh, with maybe, I would say, five or six of these. It's kind of unique to Boolean algebra, okay? So these are all in the assignment itself. So you know, it's, it, the, the assignment is more or less you know, self-contained from this perspective. All right, so are we okay so far? Are we good? Okay, all right. So now we switch back to the lecture material. The lecture material is uh, propositional logic, and we have been talking about this for a while. Last time, we talked about resolution logic. So resolution, in this case, is basically saying this implication here is always true. And right here, we have an example of Boolean algebra. <laughs> right there. This is this is perfect as an example of Boolean algebra, except this time I'm using the V symbol for or instead of the plus, and I'm using a distinct you know, uh, conjunction operator, which looks like a TP. Um, so I think today is a good day to really kind of go over these steps you know, slowly so that you guys can understand, oh, so you use that rule over here, or you use, you use that rule over there, and so on. Is that okay? All right. So <clears throat> what I'll do is I'm going to do this on the tablet itself. And um, so this way I can work on it step by step and you guys can ask questions as I work it out. All right, I'm just double checking. We are indeed recording and everything is good <laughs> because I didn't check last time and go like, oh man, at the end of the class, you know, there was no recording. All right, so I am going to start the tablet. Okay, let me get out of this. S C R C P Y. There we go. Oh. Okay. And the first thing I need to do, I mean, you know, because I need to take a look at the Actually, I don't. Okay. All right. So what I do is I mean, is this background okay? Because you know the dots can be a little confusing. Should I use just completely blank, or is this okay with you guys? Okay. All right. All right. So we're gonna get started here. The um, the implication itself is saying you know a um, or b. Okay. I'm converting all the Greek letters to uh, alphabet. Your letters, because it's harder to say, you know, psi, phi, you know, and rho, and A, B, and C are much easier to say. That's the reason. So we have not B or C, and this implies A or C. So this is the expression that I want to work on, okay? And eventually I want to end up with just true in this case, okay? Because I want to make sure that whatever, if I see this pattern on the left-hand side, it is always going to imply the, the right-hand side, which means if the left-hand side is true, the right-hand side is guaranteed to be true. If the left-hand side is false, I really don't care in that case. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is to get rid of the implication operator, okay, which is this one here. So the, the oh, I forgot that rule. I forgot that rule completely in the homework assignment. All right, so one more rule to add to the homework assignment because I completely forgot about implication. Okay, so going back to CNF. <clears throat> Until I really need to use it, I cannot, I forgot about that one. Okay, I'll put it right before commutative. This is about the definition of implication. Implication. 
it's not really exactly a rule because you, you can look at it as a, as a definition. So on one side, we have A implies B. And then on the other side, we say this is exactly the same thing as not A or B. This one we have talked about already at the very beginning of this class. We have already defined the implication using a truth table, but also you know, as, a, as a different expression, but it has exactly the same meaning. Okay, so I just want to make sure that this one is here in your homework assignment. So this way it is complete. We are not missing anything in the homework assignment. All right, so using exactly the implication rule, okay, like this one, we switch back to the tablet and then we just work on this one. So where's my, oh, there you go. Okay, so this entire side, okay, I, I'm gonna use extra parentheses that should not be needed based on operator priority, but just to be really clear, I'm gonna add the extra parentheses. So this whole thing becomes the negation of exactly the same side, okay, A plus B, A or B, and not A, not B or C, okay. And then the implication itself, this one here, is going to become a regular or. So in this case, here we just use a plus. So it becomes this. All right, so are we doing okay so far with this transformation? And just to be consistent here, you know, I'm gonna use the exclamation point to emphasize that we are negating. This is okay, all right. So I look at this and go like, hmm, what can I do next? There are quite a few things we can do. We can use the associative law and get rid of the parentheses, which is from uh, right here, which is from here to here. I can get rid of those parentheses because of the associative law. You know, the ordering of doing the ors doesn't really matter. Is that okay? Okay, all right. So, um, or I can also work on De Morgan's law. Question? No, okay. So De Morgan's law in this case is seeing that we have a negation here and then we have a conjunction here. In other words, we have a negated conjunction, which means, you know, oh, I can apply De Morgan's law because I can negate the components of the conjunction, each one, and then change the conjunction itself into a disjunction. That's you know, how you apply De Morgan's law. So I can now say, oh, okay, this is basically the same thing as not A or B, the whole thing or the negation of uh, B not, so negation of D or C. So this is a negation of D first, there we go. And then the other side you know, stays exactly the same because you know, we are not doing anything with the right-hand side of this or here. So this is by application of De Morgan's law. So I'm gonna put some names here, over here this is uh, because of the implication rule. So this is implication. This is the Morgan's law. Okay, let me pause and see if there are any questions about the, the Morgan's law's application. I have a question just in general. Mm -hmm. like, I understand that at the end we just want it to equal one, correct? Yes. Um, but like, what intuitions do you have that are informing you to take each step? So in this case, because we want to arrive to just a one, which is true, and so you want to look up the rules and see which one will give you ones, okay, you know, on one side of the equality. So if I were to go back to the notes here, or the homework assignment, you can see that you know, only the complements will give you a one. See this one here, you know, you have you know, the a particular variable or expression or the negation of the same expression. So this is what we want to get to in order to prove that the entire thing is a one. Um, you know what, I forgot about another one. <laughs> it's only when I get to use it that I start to remember, oh wait, there's another one that is that can be useful. It is also associated with um, identity but I'm gonna you know, put it under identity here. So this one is basically the opposite of the other one. A and zero is always going to be a zero. In other words, A and false is going to be false. Whatever and false is false, okay? 
And then the other one, as you can probably imagine, is A or true is also going to be true. If at least one side of an or is a constant of true, the whole thing is guaranteed to be true. Is that okay? So this is the other one, you know, to answer your question. So this is the other tool or the other clue that I have of you know where I want to take the derivation is I want to end up with a true on one side. So if I have a true in a disjunction, then the whole thing boils down to true, which is desirable. I can also use the other one, which is you know, saying A or not A is also just true. So I'm looking for things like that. Okay. So did I answer the question? You, sure. Um, so basically your goal is to like make... <laughs> Cancel things out. Yeah, for sure. Cancel right. things out and see if I can group the negation of something with the non-negative version of the very same thing together. Okay. So you're kind of working from just a step before one. Correct. Basically. So if I can you know, somehow translate this entire thing into one gigantic disjunction, and one of the things that I, one of the components of the disjunction is the exact opposite negation of the other one, then I have achieved my objective. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, so now I look at this and go like, okay, what do I need to go next? But before I go any further, are there any questions about the application of De Morgan's Law? Okay, no questions, all right. So then I apply De Morgan's Law again, but this time it's a double application because I see that there's a negation of an or here, which means I can apply De Morgan's Law. I can also do the same thing over here. It is a negation of an or, so that means I can also apply De Morgan's Law over here. Okay, are there any questions? Because this is the pattern that I need to look for in order to understand uh, which rule is applicable here. So are there any questions about why De Morgan's Law is applicable in this case? There are two applications. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions. I'm going to go ahead and do this. So I'm no longer using extra parentheses because that really makes it harder to read the entire thing. So this becomes not A and not B. And then this or is still here. This becomes the negation of the negation of B and the negation of C. And then we have the usual ones over here. At this time, I'm dissolving the extra parentheses because they're no longer needed. Okay, so I'm going to pause here and see if there are any questions about the two applications of De Morgan's Law. So I'm going to say dm times 2 because I applied De Morgan's Law twice but on different subterms. So that, that should not cause you know, any additional confusion. Yes? Um, okay, yes. So this negation of B is basically this part here. This extra negation is distributed to the original negation of B, and that's why we have a double negation. In other words, look at the negation of B here as one thing. That thing is being negated because I am, quote unquote, distributing the negation into the original disjunction. They would, but I, I want to do things only one, one, one thing at a time. So I'm going to cancel out the double negation in the next step. Yep. But it's important to illustrate the double negation first because, you know, otherwise, you know, if I just end up with a single B here, it can be because I forgot to copy a negation. So by emphasizing that we have double negation, I remind myself that I'm not forgetting the negation. It's just that I don't want to perform the simplification in the same step. Is that okay? All right, so now I can apply the simplification as you said. So not A and not B, or B and not C, or A or C. Okay, so I look at this thing here and go like, hmm, am I anywhere closer to finding something and the negation of that very same, same thing inside a disjunction? And the answer is, eh, not yet, okay? So now the next, the, 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 the next question is, what am I going to do now? Well, 
I'm not reading my own proof, by the way, you know, on the other screen. So I'm actually working on the proof, you know, not really remembering how I did it, you know, in the notes. So what I'll do is I am going to put extra parentheses around these two. I can do that because of the associative, associative law. Okay, because associative, associative law says, you know, when you have a bunch of you know, con disjunctions, you can you know, group the disjunction any way you want. Okay, so I look at this and go like, okay, let's apply distribution. So this is kind of like FOIL, okay, except it is, you cannot do this kind of FOIL in normal algebra, but you can do it in Boolean algebra. So in this case, um, because what I'm trying to do is to get the B to hook up with the not B. Because if I can group the B and the not B into a, in the a, in a disjunction, then I get true, okay? The question is, can I get that true out of this distribution so that the entire disjunction has a single true in it? So that becomes the, the next question, but I'm just gonna explore it. So occasionally, when you are proving something like this, in, when you're working with algebra, you might end up with a scenic route, which means you're going, oh, all over the place, but you still end up you know, at where you need, okay? So do not be surprised if you end up with a lot more steps you know, than, you, than somebody else, okay? You know, because you know, when you're starting off on you know, these things, you know, even I would you know, kind of go the scenic route you know, from time to time. All right, so FOIL means you know, I take the negation of A on one side and then you'll know, use the OR from the other side like that. And then we are gonna end this with um, not B or B. And then we're going to end that with not B. Oh, okay, wait. Oh, not A again, or C. And then we end that with um, not B or C. And then we still have the or A or C outside. So the distribution is from here to here. So the distribution is you know, the FOIL between these two terms, and I'm expanding it you know, over here, okay? So I look at this and go like, hmm, I can do a little bit of simplification, but you know, it may not be too helpful to me. So I look at this and go like, hmm, we have not A or B. This becomes true. This becomes not A, you know, it's not helpful here. And then we have not B or C, and then we have or, a or C, all the way over there. So this one, you know, basically is useless. You know, so you can pretend that it's not even here. So I look at this and go like, hmm, I'm still not you know close to where I need it. So I look at this and go like, hmm, can I simplify this a little bit? And the simplification, you know, let me go back to the rules over here. So some of the simplification is not clear uh, or it's not obvious when you're looking at it because it doesn't exist in normal algebra. I'm specifically looking at something like this. So if you have A or A and B, you can simplify to A, or if you have A and A or B, you can simplify that to A as well, okay? So I'm particularly looking at the, these patterns and see if I can simplify. This is also something that you might want to do is to do simplification as you go, okay? All right, so I look at this and go like, hmm, I don't really see any way to apply the simplification because everything is or. This is, an, this is one gigantic and, and this is a or, you know, outside of that, so. And I originally ended up with a or already. So I think I might have taken this in the wrong direction already. Yep. A negation of C. Oh, you mean here. You're correct. Yep. And one. Hmm? I think I, did I catch everyone? Uh, is it? Isn't it uh, not A plus not C? So like the third, yeah. Oh, you mean here, yep. Okay, thank you. All right, very good. 
So I look at this and go like, hmm, is that going to be helpful to me to do any type of simplification? This is one gigantic conjunction, and um, I believe I can apply resolution. Okay, so where can I apply resolution? See this B over here, and see this not B over here? So I can use B as quote unquote a connector between these two. So now I apply, uh, so this is distribution, and this one is just simplification. Simplification. All right, so this one is resolution. So resolution you know, means you know, now I look at this and go like, hmm, okay. It simplifies to not A or not C. And I'm not doing anything with the not A or not C in the middle. And then we have not or A or C outside. Are we doing okay so far? Maybe. Yep. If you were to compare uh, the not B plus uh, not C. Okay. Yeah. That's coming from the foil. It, it, this one, this is also a not C. It's coming from the foil between these two. So we have not A combined with B over here, not A or not C, you know, uh, over here. Then we have not B or B, which is here. Then we have not B or not C over here. So it's the same thing as a foil, except you know, the multiplication and the addition are opposite to your normal you know, foil op operation. It doesn't make sense in normal algebra, but in Boolean algebra, it does work out. Yep. Um, for that last part, I was thinking simplification. Mm -hmm. that yep, we can do a simplification because these two terms that are ended together are exactly the same. So now we perform a simplification. We end up with just one of those two. And then that whole term is ORed with A and ORed with C. All right. So what do we do next? This is going to be an easy one. Associative, right? Because you know, what is inside parentheses is already a disjunction. And then that disjunction is being ORed with a whole bunch of other stuff. So that means the parentheses can be dissolved. So this becomes not A or not C or A or C. And then using commutative, which means I can change the ordering of things within the disjunction. I can now rearrange the whole thing to have not A to pair up with A. I can have, you know, I, that's all I need, but, but I can do the other one too. So I can have not C and C to be organized you know, to, right, next to each other. Then we have one or one, which is a one. QED. So is that okay? Yep. Inside the resolution towards like the middle part, right? Mm -hmm. yep. How come we can't apply like the resolution for like the for very first step? The very first step. So can you be more clear about which step? Oh, you mean all the way at the top? Yeah. Yeah, you can. You mean all the way over here? So that whole thing just becomes A or C. You know, A or C. Yep. Yes, you can. I just took you guys on the scenic ride. <laughs> But it really kind of shows you that you know there are many ways to do the same thing. You may not find the shortest path. So very good. Okay, you did a very good job. You're locating. You could have done it earlier, and then the whole thing is just super easy. Okay, is everybody seeing that? You know how you know, if I apply the resolution like early on, you know the answer is like staring us in the face like on the third step. We we, we could have proven the whole thing on the third step. Okay, okay. If you don't see it, you know, let me explain it. Okay, so we are gonna. I'm gonna take a part of this here to the next slide. Yep. Okay. So we'll take um, do the lasso here. I'm taking just these two lines to the next slide. Talk to me. New slide page. And we'll go back to my pen tool. Okay. So I can apply resolution right here, okay, for exactly the same reason, because we have a B over here, we have a not B over here. 
which means I can apply resolution right there. So apply resolution. The first one is implication. We still need that. So that means I end up with a negation of A um, or C. And then we have an or, A or C. Is that OK? And then we apply you know, the complementary rule because we have A or look at A or C as one single thing. OK, then you can see that, oh, OK, um, let me use highlighting to show you what I mean by that. Look at this whole thing as one thing. Look at this whole thing as you know, the same thing. So now we end up with the negation of an expression or the original expression. So we can already immediately and conclude this, this whole thing is a one by using uh, the complementary rule. Yep. So yes, I just took you guys on a long scenic ride. Are we doing okay so far with this? Any questions about under what condition we can apply loop rule? Because I think that's gonna be the main uh, question that you might have is, can I apply this rule here? Um, so obviously there's parallels to like math that you mm -hmm. just already taken. Yep. Uh, but like, where does, does like algebra just like work generally for Boolean algebra? And then Boolean algebra, we just need to be like aware of more like specific cases or is there just like not that amount of overlap? Um, well, algebra is algebra, you know, because what algebra does is to say, this expression is exactly the same as that expression over there. That's basically what algebra does. Right. So in this case, you know, we want you know, to show the entire implication is true, and this is you know, how we got it done. But in the case of CNF, that's not the objective. The objective is not to show that it is true. Uh, with CNF, we want to convert any expression into a conjunction of disjunctions, and in, in each disjunction, we only have elements from alpha or the negation of an element from alpha. So depending on the objective, you apply the same tools, but with a different objective. You know, you're, you're, you're doing transformation, basically. The question is, what is the final form that you want? All right. So now we can you know, work on some other examples. There's one in the, uh, in the text of propositional logic. So we'll go get that one, and we'll work on that one, too. So if you. If you ignore all of this stuff here, this is really just me, <clears throat> you know, formally defining what is a C, what is a uh, CNF, and what you know, what is a well-formed formula under this you know, new um, de definition. So we'll ignore that for now, okay? And instead, I'm going to show you the example, which is this expression here, which looks kind of ugly. So this is one way to do it. You know, there may be you know other ways to do it. So since it's already done here, I'm going to um, illustrate this one and explain each line, and then we can possibly go over a different way to show exactly the same thing. All right, so the first one, from the first line to the second line, what did I do? So I, I want to flip the operation and have it already done, but I want you to identify which rule did I apply between line one and line two. Yep, exactly. So very good. The implication rule where R implies Q becomes not R or Q. Excellent. What about between the second and the third line? What did I do? <coughs> Go ahead. D Morgan's Law. Okay, so I think what you meant is also D Morgan's Law. Because we have a negation of an or, so that means I can distribute, quote unquote, you know, the negation to each component of the original or, and then change the or into an and. And then from here to here, it is a simplification because the negation of the negation of something is just that something. Double negation cancels out itself. And then what about from here to here? 
from here to here. Looks like a little optometrist, you know, you know, question. A or B? Okay, so what, what happened between here and here? Which rule did I apply? Distribution, very good. So I'm distributing you know, the P or T over you know, R and not Q. In other words, I'm treating R or R and not Q as one thing, and, you know, and then I'm using the uh, other side, you know, P or T, as the other term that has two components. So that's how I can end up with the and P on one side, and then the and T on the other side. But then I have to respect this operator, so the two new conjunctions are ORed together. This is almost the same thing as the normal distribution that you do in algebra. If you look at disjunction as addition, and if you look at conjunction as multiplication, that should be that look that should look familiar to you. All right. So from here to here, I'm using you know distribution again. This one is super messy <laughs> because I am looking at a three-term disjunction or a three-term uh, disjunction, and three times three is nine. So I end up ended up with nine terms. Is that okay? All right. So then from here to here, I use distribution again. <laughs> this time I'm distributing the not p over the nine terms that I have over here. So now we end up with this entire thing. I did not do a simplification in between, okay? I probably should have done that, but I did not, okay? So that means, you know, when you are working on this particular question, you probably want to apply your know, simplification when you can so that you don't end up with something looking this ugly because you actually have to scroll a little bit to see the other end. So from here to here, I start to apply simplification. R or R simplifies to just R itself. Um, and then we have a bunch you know, that will simplify to true because over here we have not P or P, which, the, which means the entire thing simplifies to true. Over here we have not P or P again, simplifies to true. Over here we have not P or P, it simplifies to true again. So that accounts for the three. These three basically are gone because they are all true. But since the truths are inside the conjunction, you can only remove the truths, but you cannot conclude anything about the conjunction itself. So from here to here, I just remove the extra terms that are not needed. From here to here is the most, um, the, this is the step that is the least obvious to people. Because what happens here, okay, let me go back to the assignment because I want to show you which rule we applied over here. So if I were to go back to the assignment, the simplification that it did over there is one of these two. So A or A and B is just A, A and A or B is just A. So one of these two. So when you look at the derivation, all right, so I think it's easier for me to point on the screen itself. So we can see how we have P, uh, not P or not Q. Not P or not Q is already here. So that means any term in the conjunction that also includes not P or not Q, they are extra. So that means this one is extra because not P or not Q is already covered here. Boring any additional items inside you know, the same conjunction is not going to be helpful. So that's why I can cross this out. It's like, okay, you're not adding any new information, you know, it, you're useless. Uh, same with this one. So we, we have not P or R over here already. So any disjunction in the conjunction that also has not P or R, they're extra, they're not needed. So that means you know, this one is extra because this one has not P or R or not Q. The not Q is extra, it's useless to us. Same thing over here, not P or R or T is also extra. It's this or T is not needed because we already have not P or R. So that's why this term is also you know, useless. They can be taken out, and that's how we can simplify the entire thing down to the final answer, which is not P or R, the whole thing, and not P or not Q, the entire thing. This is now in, D, in CNF, in conjunctive normal form, because the entire thing is one conjunction. Each component of the conjunction by itself is a disjunction, and then each disjunction only has terms that are things coming from alpha or the negation of things coming from alpha directly. Yes? Would 
this fail? Do you add disjunctions instead of commas between all of your expressions in the second and last line? Second to the last line, this line here? So you mean you flip all the conjunctions and the disjunctions? Yeah. You it will still simplify. Okay. It will still simplify because when you look at the the rules that we quoted here, so the ones that we applied was this one. This was the one that we applied. But if you look at you know the other one, it also works. Are we doing okay so far? Is everybody convinced that this simplification should work in your mind? Because you can kind of go through it intuitively by saying, what if A is true? What if A is false in both expressions? And go like, oh, I guess they do, they do boil down to the same thing. That's one way to look at it. The other way is to use a truth table. Really look at the four cases, like you know, considering A and B are being completely independent, work out every single row so that you can see you know, how you know, A or A and B is really just A, and how A and A or B is also really just A. So do you guys want me to kind of go over that, or you guys are pretty convinced already and you don't need me to show it? Uh, if you go over it, but as it pertains to the example, like what value would you, or like, yeah, like how would you uh, categorize like A? And then how would you categorize okay. B as it pertains to like um, because, algebra? Yeah, because it's algebra. Yeah. So you can group things in, you, you, can, you can basically look at A not as a single variable, but as an expression. Sure. So it just has to be that expression, you know, and then the expression and something. Sure. So let me first you know, go through the truth table just so that you know what I mean earlier when I said, you know, you can basically prove it to yourself that the simplification does work, it makes sense. So I'm gonna work on that. We have A, B, and then we have A and A or B. So I'm using this one, but you can work on the other one if you want to. So A can be false, A can be true. While A is false, B can be false or true. And while A is true, B can also be false or true. This is how we end up with the four rows. So when you look at the value of the expression, when A is false, uh, I don't have to look at A or B, because you know, one side of the conjunction is false already, the whole thing has to be false. Um, when A is false, same thing over here. And when A is true, okay, when A is true, then A or B is also going to be true. Because you know, in order for the or to be true, at least one side has to be true, but when A is true, A or B is also true. So then we have true or true, which is also true. So when B is true, then obviously A or B is also going to be true. Then we still end up with A or, uh, true or true, which is also true. So now you look at this column here. You look at this column here. They are exactly the same. And this is how we can prove using a truth table that A as, an exp as a single expression versus A and A or B in parentheses are exactly the same thing. The A or B contributes nothing to the entire thing. Is that okay? So you can do exactly the same exercise, but for the other simplification rule and convince yourself that, oh, okay, it does work. This is one of the most, um, this is the least obvious you know, simplification rule that people do not usually see. So watch out for opportunities to apply this kind of simplification when you're working on your assignment. All right, any questions? Did I address all your questions earlier? Because I thought you asked a different question as well. Um, so like in the case of the example, A would just be like not right. P uh, or R. So in our example, uh, basically, you know, with, so there are two applications of the simplification over these two lines. So with, in one case, I consider not P or R as A. So now we have A or not Q, right? You know, the not Q becomes the B, so it simplifies to the first one. And then the other one is looking at not B or not Q as the A. Then we have not P or not Q or R being the A or B. So I, I, I really kind of combine the two steps into one because it's the application of exactly the same rule, just over different components. 
Are we good so far? Okay, here's the next question. This is the important part. So you're doing the derivation, and you are concerned that you might have made a mistake somewhere, like I did earlier. So how do you check that each step along the way, you preserve the original expression, or the value is preserved? Yes? I think that's a cursory check. You could just imagine like your two variables as like one and zeros. Mm -hmm. And you could just like use a logical operation between and and or okay. at that stage. Like you could use the rules, but like, if you don't want to use the rules and you're like crunched for time and stressed out during the test, I think you could just look at that <laughs> particular expression mm -hmm. and think to yourself logically, okay, so one, zero, one, and zero, that's false, so zero, and then like move along that little parenthesis. Mm -hmm. Except you're not in the test when you're doing this, so that means you, you can potentially use a spreadsheet to help you, okay? I'm not going to say, I would not say that this is an easy approach, but it's a doable approach. Okay, so I am going to um, go back to you know, one of the early expressions. So we are just going to look at this, uh, these two expressions here, um, the top one versus the one right below. Okay, you know, you know, the one is before the uh, application of resolution, the other one is after the application of resolution. So I look at these two and I ask, how do I you know, kind of use a spreadsheet to help me with that? Um, okay, that doesn't help. Because <clears throat> I want to show you both the spreadsheet and also the expression at the same time. All right. So the first thing is we need um, the truth table stuff, you know, which means you know, column A is for variable A, column B is for variable B, and column C is for variable C. The question is, how do I get the true false value into this whole thing without having me to do all the work? Because can I do this? Yeah, I can do it. You know, false, false, false. False, whoops, false, false, true, false, whoops, false, true, false, and then we have false, true, true, then we have true, false, false, and so on. That is tedious, okay? But some of you may recognize it's like, Tech, isn't, isn't this really just an, you know, a list of binary numbers in increasing, you know, order? You know, because you can look at row A or row 1 as 0, 0, 0 as a binary number, that's just 0. Row 2 is 0, 0, 1, which is just 1. 0, 1, 0 is 2 in base 2. Uh, 0, 1, 1 is 3 in base 2. 1, 0, 0 is 4 in base 2, and so on. So if you recognize that pattern, great, okay? Because that's exactly what it is, okay? We are basically just saying, oh, it, we are just looking at 0 to 7, in this case, for 8 rows, and we are just converting the value from 0 to 7 into the base 2 representation. That's all we are doing. So now the question is, uh, so how do we do this in a quick and easy way? Now, if you're also in CISP 310, or you have taken CISP 310 from me in a prior semester, you might remember there's an equation to do just that, okay? So I'm going to use that equation here. So let me first explain the equation using the, the tablet, and then we'll get back into that. So the equation is d of i is the floor of the value divided by the base, which is in this case base 2, is d is 2, raised to the power of i, the whole thing, mod d. So di is digit i, d is the value, b is the base, which is 2 in, in the case of base 2, and i is controlling which digit are we talking about. Is that okay? All right. So now we translate this you know, into the spreadsheet. So we go back to the spreadsheet here, and let's just say, now, in the spreadsheet, there's a way to refer to the row number and also the column number of the cell. They are respectively row, open paren, close paren, and column, open paren, and close paren. Okay, so not too difficult to do. Um, and, okay, give me a second here. I'm going to copy the equation to the part of the tablet that you can see. So you can now you actually look at the, trans the how I translate this equation into the spreadsheet equation. Okay, so now we are all ready. So this is, I will consider this digit zero. Okay, so column A is digit zero, just to be kind of easy to deal with. 
So we are looking at the mod of the floor of something, and the floor is going to look at the value. But the value is going to be the row number minus one, okay? Because that's the easiest and quickest way to get to zero to seven is to look at the row number and subtract one from it. So that means the numerator is going to be the row number minus one because the row number starts with one, but I want it to start with zero. So subtracting by one is going to take care of that problem. And then we want to divide that by you know, the base raised to the power of i. So that would be just using the power function, power or power POW from uh, in base two raised to the digit. So which digit are we talking about? The column number is corresponding to the digit. So column A is digit zero, column B is digit one, column C is digit two, blah, 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 and so on. So we now refer to the column number minus one because column A is technically the first column or column one since I want to convert it to column or digit zero, so I have to do a subtraction by one so that I can convert from a one-oriented counting system to a zero-oriented counting system. Close the paren, close that. So now we have the floor, and we want to mod the entire thing by two because we're dealing with base two. So now we are done with the mod. And from this point on, it's just a matter of copy and paste. Ooh, like that. Done. Not exactly in the, it, this is opposite to the order that we want, but it doesn't matter. Is that okay? So this is a quick and easy way to get you, you know, the beginning or the starting point of a truth table, okay? So what do we do next? Well, what we're gonna do next is we are looking at this equation or this expression and to turn it into a spreadsheet, you know, uh, what we call a formula, okay? So all of these are formulae because you know, they are just uh, expressions that are that needs to be evaluated. Okay, so at this point, the second line is what we want to convert because the spreadsheet does not have implied, okay? You can sort of get the implied to work here, but it really does not have it. So the implication, you really cannot double check using this particular way, but the rest I can. So now I can say this is the negation of the conjunction of some kind of disjunction and then some kind of disjunction close the conjunction. Oh, I, I'm missing one entire or on the outside too. So this is the or of that and the or of something else close that. Okay, I'm missing a parenthesis somewhere. I think I'm missing it here. There we go. Okay, so I got the structure of the thing done. You know, then I go back and populate what do I have in the, in the innermost, the first, leftmost, innermost uh, disjunction. So that turns out to be A or B. So over here, I just have to refer to, oh, this is one of the things I need to OR. This is the other thing that I need to OR. And then this one here is corresponding to the not B or C. So that means I have to do a negation first, and then we have to do an OR over here. So the negative term is B, which is column B. And then the other side of the disjunction is C, which is column C over here. And then up here, we have the OR that is you know, kind of all the way out. It is ORing between the A and the C. So that means we have the A here and then the C over here. And the whole thing is true. So then we just go like, ah, come on, there we go. And they're all true. Are you surprised that they're all true? Why are you not surprised, or why are you not suppo supposed to be surprised that they're all true? Disjunction. No, this is a, yeah? Um, I was just gonna say, like, because it simplifies the why, not the x. It is my way of proving why resolution works. In other words, this is really just a, uh, a way of presenting the same thing that we already talked about earlier and also last time because you know, when we talked about just resolution itself, give me a second to move this one back here. Um, okay, I can see why it's doing this because the screen or this browser is actually much wider than it is here. So if I just maximize, that should fix the problem. There we go. All right. 
See this thing here? What if I rename this phi as A, the psi as B, and then the rho as C? Then we end up with, guess what? The same thing in on the tablet, this thing here, which is also the same thing in the spreadsheet. That's why they're all ones, because you know, that implication is guaranteed to be a one. In other words, not only have I used Boolean algebra to show that, okay, one scenic route and one short route, that the implication should always be a one, I'm also using a spreadsheet to show you exactly the same thing. Is that okay? So this is how you can check, okay? Because if I made a mistake, okay, and I you know, present the uh, formula equivalent to the second you know, expression, which there's, there's a mistake, I would not, I should not be getting all truths back. So if these two are not the same, then I have made a mistake in this particular step, then I should go back and double check to make sure that, you know, okay, what mistake did I make, and so on. Is that okay? So I'm giving you the tools. I'm giving you multiple tools. First, the, the algebra rules, and then now using a spreadsheet to help you double check your steps. Now, do you want to use the spreadsheet approach to double check every single step? If you got the time, it's not a problem. But if you say, okay, I don't want to do it you know, every single step, then you can use, uh, if your answer does not appear to be right, you cannot get to the answer, then what you do is you do a binary search for the one part that has gone wrong. Okay, so let me show you what I mean by that. Okay, so using a new sheet here. So let's just say that you have done a bunch of your derivations. Um, change the tool back to a pen. So you have done a bunch of derivations, okay? You, you need to do the spreadsheet thing for the first one, okay? Because this is the reference point, and then you do it for the last one. If they don't match, that means you made a mistake somewhere, right? So then what do you do? Do you go to the second step? No, you do a binary search. So you take something that's all that's straight in the middle and you check that one. <laughs> if that one is also wrong, that means the mistake is earlier and you need to kind of you know, go to, like, you know, if I were you, I would check here. But if this one is still right, okay, if this one matches this one here, that is a strong indication. It's not a proof, but it's a strong indication that the mistake is somewhere here. So then you apply the same thing, pick the middle of this section here, test it. So you basically use the binary search principle so that you know, if you have 16 steps, or I should say 15 steps, if you have 15 steps, then how many times do you have to do this until you find the one statement that you got wrong the first time? Four, yep, four is correct. Because you know, four, two to the power four minus one is 15. So using binary search, four checks will help you locate exactly where the mistake is. All right. Are there any questions about the <clears throat> uh, CNF conversion thing? No questions? No, we are taking a non-CNF expression and turning into a CNF first. Yep. All right. Is it, is it like difficult to look at the non-CNF and then be able to determine the CNF? Or do you like have to go to the steps to Determined. There are certain steps, you know, there are certain um, steps that you have to take, okay? So now we can take a, take a look at back at the notes because the notes actually, you know, I try to express, you know, what you need to do when you are converting into a CNF. So, uh, okay. So this is my kind of cryptic way to do it. So I'm going to summarize in a slightly different way, okay? All right, so the steps to do this is apply the Morgan's Law until you can no longer apply that. 
that's almost guaranteed to be something that you need to do. The reason why you have to keep applying the Morgan's Law until you can no longer apply the Morgan's Law is because in the end, you really cannot end up with the negation of an end or the negation of an or. So that means every single time you see a, the, the negation of an end or the negation of an or, you have to break it up. You have to do the quote unquote di distribution. So you always have to apply the Morgan's Law whenever it is applicable. This is like guaranteed. Whenever <coughs> applicable. So that's almost going to be the first step. So the second one is take a look at what you have after you apply all the De Morgan's Law. Because if you end up with your P or Q or T, okay, this is just an example. Everything you know, boils down to this. This does not look like a CNF because there's no conjunction in it, but it is a CNF. Because you can easily turn this into a format that meets all the requirements. What is a CNF again? It is a conjunction of disjunctions, right? You look at this thing here and go like, I don't see a conjunction. Are you convinced now? <laughs> yes, it is a conjunction of disjunctions, okay? But then you look at the one and you say, I'm not convinced the one is a disjunction. Fine. Are you convinced now? In other words, it's, it's, it's easy, okay? You know, once you get to P or Q or T, it is a CNF already, okay? You can stop right there. Um, what if you end up with something that looks like P, Q, or uh, T, okay? What if you end up with something like that? That is certainly not a CNF because it is an OR, and on the, okay, if the last operation is an OR, and on one side of the OR, you have a conjunction, it is not in CNF, okay? So what do you do? The only thing you can do in this case is <laughs> you, you'll probably end up with another question coming back from me. It's like, okay, have you, which rule have you considered applying, right? Because the whole point is you don't want to just ask someone and ask which rule is the right one to apply. You try them out, okay? Is anything going to blow up? Is somebody going to die? I certainly hope not. So give it a try, right? So in this case, what rule is actually applicable? There's only one rule that is applicable in this case. Distribu distribution. So once you distribute, what do you get? P or T? and Q or T, oh, that is CNF. It is a conjunction of disjunctions. Inside each disjunction, we only have elements from alpha or the negation thereof. We don't, have any, we don't actually have any negation in this case, but it meets the requirement, right? Okay, so what if you end up with something, you know, what if you have something that's, that starts with a negation and then in the inside you got stuff, okay, like, there's a disjunction here, okay? And Q, P or Q, P or Q. What if you have something like that? Is that in CNF right now? It is not in CNF because it is not a conjunction of stuff. It is the negation of something, right? So that means you're definitely not done at this point. But at the same time, you only also have one thing that is applicable right now. It only fits the pattern of one of the rules that I have give, given you. Which one is that? De Morgan's Law, exactly. Because you have the negation of an or, so that means the only applicable transformation is De Morgan's Law. Once you apply De Morgan's Law, you have not P and not Q. You go like, uh, but tech, that doesn't look like you know, a CNF or conjunctive normal form. Is it a conjunction? Yes, but I don't see a conjunction of disjunctions. Um, okay. Does it look like a, oops, this is supposed to be Q. Does that look like a conjunction of disjunctions now? Yes, because all we have to do is to say, oh, if there's no or, 
just make it or false. That always turns something into a disjunction. Is that okay? So there are very distinct and clear cases where I don't have anything else to apply. It has to be the application of blah. Is that, yep. Mm -hmm. Why? Because resolution is relying on CNF. Because, okay, so that's a very good question. The question was, why are we so concerned about CNF? Why do we convert, why are we trying to convert every expression into a CNF? So if we go back to the discussion of um, resolution, which you know, there's also a handwritten version, but we'll take a look at this version here. So do you see how this is a conjunction and these are all disjunctions? That's a CNF. It can be a part of a bigger CNF, right? So what you see here, or what is applicable you know, in this case, can be only a small part of a gigantic you know, CNF. All we are trying to do is to identify two con disjunctions of the same conjunction and say, oh, you have the non-negative version of this variable and you have the negation of negative version of that variable, let's apply resolution, right? But the beauty of applying resolution is whatever you end up with is shorter. The variable that you use to connect the two original disjunction is gone in the result of the resolution. So you only end up with simpler and simpler and simpler terms until you get to until you get to nothing. Okay? What do you mean by nothing? That can be nothing, nothing. I mean what what do you mean by nothing? So let me show you what I mean by nothing. Okay? So okay, first of all is oh, you guys cannot see it yet. Let me switch. Is that CNF? It's not PIP by the way. It is P and not P. Is that a CNF? Sure it is. It is a conjunction of disjunctions. I see the conjunction but not the disjunction. Fine. Is that a disjunction? Is that a disjunction? Okay. Can we apply resolution? Sure. This is the non-negative version of a variable. This is the negation, the negative version of the same variable. So uh, we apply resolution. But after you apply resolution, what do you get? That, right? Which simplifies to that. But what do you what do you do when you're when you have a huge, big, gigantic conjunction, and then you one of those terms you turn into a false? What do you what, what is the conclusion in that case? The whole conjunction is false, okay? Because one component implies the false, the whole thing has to be false. So the next natural question that you might have, you know, I'm not taking role today, is why are we trying to get to false? Aren't we trying to prove something is true? Why are we getting trying to get to false, right? You know, that's, it, it doesn't seem to make sense. It is because we are trying to apply proof by contradiction. So the technique that we are using here is a culmination of a few things. One is resolution, which necessitates CNF. The second one is proof by contradiction. How many people know what is proof by contradiction because you took some other math classes or you took a philosophy class and they talked about proof by uh, contradiction. So go, go ahead, you first and then you. Not, it's not the same thing as a counterexample. It's very different from a counterexample because with counterexample, you can only prove that a statement is not a theorem. But you cannot prove a statement is indeed a theorem by a counterexample. So you, go ahead. <laughs> so you come up with a statement with, um, you prove that it's true. Mm -hmm. Then, You're not trying to prove a statement is true. You're trying to prove a statement is can be implied by a bunch of stuff. That is what you're trying to prove. Yeah. So go ahead. Keep going. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah, I don't want to put you on the spot. Okay, so let's me so I I know we are 
running out of time, but this is really kind of important because it gels, it, it, it shows you why, how everything is connected. So I'm going to use Psi here to basically uh, represent everything that is known to be true, okay? All the axioms, um, the given part of your question, and so on, okay? So Psi can be a huge, gigantic statement of some kind that represents everything that is known you know, to be true, okay? So that's your starting point. We want to prove that psi implies some kind of phi, where phi is the statement that we suspect is a theorem. If we can establish this you know, implication, then we're all good. That is what a mathematical proof is, is you start with things that are axiomatic. What, what type of axiomatic stuff are we talking about? The, all the algebra rules, okay? All the given values in a problem, and so on and so forth, those combine into what we call psi over here. And we are trying to make, now this implication is a simplification because it can be a very long chain of implications, okay? But in the end, it is really just implications. So we want to imply your know, phi, which is a single statement that we have a strong suspicion has to be true. If psi is true, then phi has to be true, okay? That's basically what a proof is. Proof by contradiction is doing something funky that says, you know, if you negate um, phi, then it has to imply false. In other words, you, you still have psi representing everything that is known and given to be true. You still have phi representing the proposed you know, theorem, the theorem that you're trying to inspect and investigate and prove. But if you negate the very theorem or the statement that you need to prove that is true, you negate it, and then you have a conjunction with everything that is known to be true, then this has to imply false. Yes? So then you're going down the statement of when the mind is saying not this, not that, not that, using your axiom to show that you get not that. So by proving that you get not that, you get that. So I know. The, the, we convert everything into CNF. So that means your know, psi is going to be a CNF. That also means not phi is also going to be a CNF, which makes this entire thing, the left-hand side of the implication, one gigantic you know, CNF, right? So the resolution is the mechanism to try to get to false. Because every time you apply resolution, something gets annihilated, annihilated between two disjunctions. So in the end, what we want to do is to see something like this. And then when these two terms you know, uh, resolve, then you get false, which means the entire conjunction, the entire CNF is going to be false. But if, the if this part here is false and the implication is true, that means, oh, excuse me, I take it back. So if, you, if everything, if this implication works, that means you know, this whole thing on the left hand side has to be false, which means your know, psi phi, excuse me, phi has to be true. So we'll we'll talk about you know, the the mechanism of proof by contradiction next Monday. Okay? But I want to give you a preview because you know since you guys were already asking why is CNF so important? CNF is important because of resolution. But why is resolution important? It's because resolution is a deletive process. It reduces in, uh, the statements or the expressions to be simpler and simpler, and it is what we can use combined with proof by contradiction to show that a statement is indeed a theorem. I know it all sounds really convoluted and even contradictory. You know, it sounds contradictory, but they all work you know, together so that we can have a very predictable system to prove theorems that is that has a finite space. Remember the haystack? So this way we have a finite haystack, which also means, you know, given I know how much time it will take at the most to come to a conclusion, which beats having an infinitely large you know, haystack and you're asked to find a needle in that infinitely large haystack. So that's what we are trying to do here. Okay, so right now our focus with your homework assignment is just CNF, convert a non-CNF Boolean expression to a CNF. That's the focus right now.
We have one more class before the homework is due. I always structure the homework assignments that way, so that this way, if you have any questions, you can bring those questions next Monday. The assignment is due on Wednesday. So that means, you know, try to work on this as soon as possible, okay? So this way, you know, if you get really stuck, you can come to my office hour and ask questions. All right, I'll see you guys next Monday. Have a nice weekend, but do not forget to do your homework. Give me a second to stop recording. So this time we got the recording.